Aloha, welcome to Condo Insider, Hawaii show about association living. Anyway, I'm Richard Emery, your co-host or your host today. You may have missed me in the last six or eight weeks. I was uh, on vacation visiting the fires in Sydney and uh, had some business obligations, but I'm glad to be back and all is well. And today's a very important day in Hawaii. It's January 23rd, 2020, the day of the cutoff for the bills for the 2020 legislature. And to date, we still haven't got all the records from today yet, but it looks like we have about 14 bills introduced that affect condo living. And I have as my co-host guest today, the wonderful Jane Sugimura. Welcome, Jane. Hi. Hi, Richard. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. That is Chinese New Year tomorrow. You know? Right. So uh, I'm going to a Chinese New Year celebration tomorrow. But anyway, the legislature. I know you and I have been looking at what we've seen so far. We don't have final opinions. But let's begin with a couple of the bills we see. One long needed, Senate Bill 2200, regarding the famous emotional support animals. What do you know yes, about that? Uh, yeah, yeah. Right. That that's a, a very interesting. And the reason it, I, you know, and, and Senator Sharon Maury Walkie introduced it at uh, at our request, uh, Hawaii Council's request, uh, because we had uh, a you know a, a lot of uh, concern about the people who the the licensed professionals who were writing the letters uh, that were being given to boards of directors uh, for animals that were not uh, you know the uh, what do you call it the um, uh, this is especially trained the service animals uh, the emotional support animals and so this bill basically says to the licensed professional uh, you need to actually see the person that you're writing the letter for and you have to uh, examine that person and uh, uh, make written, written findings that that person you know uh, has a disability and that 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 the assistance animal uh, that uh, the letter is about is going to alleviate symptoms of that disability. And that disability is, is something that uh, is covered by the Americans for Disability Act. And we think that, we, well, we hope that if this bill passes, that you know, the licensed professionals will be uh, uh, a lot more careful about writing these letters so that you know, they, you know, so, so it, it doesn't result in somebody wanting a pet going to their, you know, neighborhood, friendly, friendly neighborhood doctor and saying, you know, here's this letter form. Can you just sign it without, you know, examining me and determining that I have a disability under ADA? Well, you know, the paper today had an article about the, I want to say the FAA on people bringing in uh, service animals or emotional support animals on aircraft. And they're really tightening up the rules, you know, the, they make it, it only can be a dog. And number two, they again have to have the requisite forms completed showing that a licensed professional says they're in need of that animal and what disability that animal services. This has been a long time problem in a way. Yeah, but, you know, I think it's because, you know, people are, 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 you know, just fed up with the abuses. I know in my building, I mean, we, we have, uh, we have a, a, a bylaw amendment saying no pets. And I have people coming up to me all the time and saying, why do we have all these animals in the building? And why do some people have two and three animals? You know, uh, they can't all be service animals. And, and, you know, so, but, you know, we get these letters and they're signed by a doctor or a psychologist or a licensed social worker. I mean, and, and it says what it says that the person has a disability and needs the animal. I mean, we really don't have any choice uh, but to allow it to happen, allow them to have it. Otherwise, you know, the, the Hawaii Civil Rights Commission comes down on us. And nobody can, wants that. Well, the problem has been in the past that the Hawaii Civil Rights Commission has opposed this type of bill from the beginning, saying it's a hardship on the disabled person. For them, they'll feel embarrassed about having to go do this. And, you know, I think it's a time in our society that people have to rationalize and justify 
otherwise there's abuse. So hopefully right. we'll get. And you know, I, and I've heard from some, you know, from some disabled people that that they really don't mind something like this because you know they're you know because they they are aware of the abuses and it makes it harder for them. I mean, the the truly disabled people who really need need to you know have. Uh, the uh, house rules or the regulations, you know, dealing with pets modified so that they could have them. And so it just makes it, it, it makes it harder for them. And so, you know, th this bill, I think, is going to truly uh, protect those people who really are disabled and uh, are entitled under the federal law uh, to have the, the house rules modified so that they can have this animal live with their, them in their units. Well, the other thing that I see in the in the list, we have a lot of bills, so we're going to kind of touch on them lightly today and then come back in the next week or so and talk about each one in more details and the right. pros and the cons. But one of the ones I saw that was interesting was Senate Bill 2419, which basically says, makes violations of voting requirements for elections of a condominium association subject to the enforcement powers of the real estate commission and i believe there's a companion house bill on this as well Have yeah i was looking at that i was looking at that and i'm saying what kind of i mean it, it just makes it very vague it says what i mean it's violations of voting requirements and i know you know we have you know over the years we've seen you know various uh complaints being made you know about pro improper proxies and Maybe the ballots weren't counted correctly, but you know there are already provisions for holding the the proxies in the ballots so that the people who are objecting to maybe the result can yeah, go yeah, and look at it. them. I, I I hear from a very small group every year that the sky is falling, but I haven't seen it in practice. But House Bill 2165, but not the companion bill, has related issues saying requires the managing agents of come from dominiums to confirm the eligibility of candidates for board elections and the authority of proxy assignments. I, and I haven't looked at that closely yet, but first of all, a lot of condos don't have managing agents. What do they do? Yeah, and, and you know, to me, I thought it was really vague. I mean, how do you determine whether somebody is eligible? I mean, is there an owner? Or, or an officer or director or a general partner of the partner that owns the entity. I mean, I, I mean, and, and, and Richard, you, you know, you work for Socia. How, I mean, what, is there a process that happens uh, when somebody, you know, says, you know, uh, you know, puts in uh, a request to be uh, considered for the board? And, you know, to me, I'm thinking once you put up the names, if they're not, you know, proper people, if they're not an owner, they're not part of a corporation or a general part, the other owners are going to speak up real quickly. You know, they, yeah. you know, they're not shy about that. And if that happens, then, you know, they just, they should be removed from the ballot. Well, all condominium managing agents have a list of owners. And it basically matches the tax records on who the owners are. And from that, you take proxies in and you check off the list that, yeah, they're an owner and they look to see if they're signed and meet the statutory requirements and proxies are issued and people are nominated who are, are owners, right, of the, of the mm -hmm. association. And there are times that uh, people have tried to be nominated who aren't owners on the list and managing agents typically don't allow them to be nominated. So I'm not sure what the rub is here. Um, it certainly isn't a widespread problem, but it seems that people are trying to infer that managing agents are, are are not being diligent with regard to conducting an election and who's able to vote and, and who's able to be nominated. And I, I just don't think that's the case. And I haven't seen mm -hmm. anything in the past to show that's a widespread problem in a way. Yeah, uh, I, I, I haven't seen it as a problem either, but, you know, why don't we see what comes up in the testimony? Because that usually kind of ferrets out what the real issues are or where exactly, you know, what, what area is affected. Because usually they're the ones who will come and testify. And you figure out, oh, okay, that, you know, affects these people. And then you can, you know, people, you, know, you can make the adjustment in the bill. 
yeah, no way not to ever argue with with you, but when we say the real issues, it's their perception of the real issues because um, there just is no evidence of this widespread problem. And, and, right. uh, and so someone's trying to make an issue. But another two bills, Senate bills, introduced by our Senator Baker, one of our really conscientious senators in the legislature, has to do with repealing the sunset provision of Act 195 and Act 196. Can you explain what that means? You're right. 195 was the priority of payments bill. And, and you know, this is very controversial because, you know, if you weren't, if the property managers and the condominium associations weren't diligent, I mean, the, the, you know, the, the, the priority of payments uh, process led to some abuse. And, you know, a priority of payments means that, you know, if, if uh, you miss the payment, and and with if you're on sure pay for some reason if you miss the payment or made it late um let's say you it, because the sure pay comes out of your bank account and you didn't have the money there and somehow it didn't get paid and by the time you got the money in it was late anyway you incurred a late charge and and because it's automatic the and the and if the property management company doesn't tell you that it was late and you're going to be assessed a late charge. You don't know because you because owners don't get monthly statements. Uh, at least most associations don't get monthly. Uh, they don't have monthly statements. And then so so you know the owners don't usually find out until you have you know late charges and attorneys fees and whatnot. And it's maybe hundreds, several hundreds or thousands of dollars. And this created you know some you know bad feelings between boards and owners sometimes there were foreclosure and so th there was a bill to uh delete the priority of payments in the condo statute and that doesn't mean that the associations can't collect um late charges it just means that you know you, it doesn't go to the top of the list so that when the uh the um uh the next month's uh, maintenance fee becomes due it doesn't get applied to the late charge first so that you're always late. What was Act 196? 196. 196, 196 was uh, one that uh, uh, introduced uh, binding, voluntary binding arbitration, and it expanded the mediation statute to add other people because before it was just uh, the owners and the board, and now you you know bo uh, board members. Uh, can uh, you know who are have disputes against each other and the managing agents? You know they they are now additional parties, and there are additional some other changes regarding the mediation. Where if you uh, uh, if you uh, ask for mediation, evaluate mediation, and you don't get it, then you can file a motion to compel and recover up to fifteen hundred dollars in in uh, legal fees. You know for that effort and. I think the, the the sunset provisions in both acts were put into the uh, bills at in conference. So it, the, the the sunsets weren't you know part of the public debate process. And I think they were put in because you know the legislators were concerned that there might be abuse. And you know for for both of them, they've been in effect for a year now. There has been no abuse. And you know I think it's a good thing that the sunsets are going away. Yeah. I agree, because what we're basically saying, the sunset is both these are already laws, Act 195, 196, but they expire at the end of this year or sometime, I think, this year or next. And what this no, bill is... The, the priority of payments sunset is June 30th of this year, 2020. Okay. And so what this does okay. basically is eliminate the it sunset it so it continues on. So on that note, we're going to take a short one-minute break, and we'll come back and discuss a few more of the bills that have been introduced that we'll be debating over the next couple of months. We'll be right back in a okay. minute. Aloha. My name is Wendy Lowe, and I want you to join me as we take our health back. On my show, all we do is talk about things in everyday life, in Hawaii or abroad. I have guests on board that would just talk about different aspects of health in every, in every way, whether it's medical health, nutritional health, diabetic health, you name it, we'll talk about it, even financial health. We'll even have some of the Miss Hawaii's on board and all the different topics that I feel will make your health and your lifestyle a lot better. So come join me. I welcome you to take your health back. Mahalo.
Aloha, my name is Deray Shin. You are watching Think Tech Hawaii. I will be hosting a show here every other Wednesday at 1 p.m. and we will be talking to a lot of experts and guests around sustainability, social justice, the future here in Hawaii, progressive politics, and a whole lot more. So please tune in and thank you for watching Think Tech Hawaii. Welcome back to Condo Insider We're with Jane Sugimura talking about the legislature and what bills we expect to talk about in 2020. Uh, I should say that we are a biennium as far as the legislature. There's a lot of old bills from last year that uh, technically are still alive that didn't get a hearing last year that we're not talking about. So there's a bunch of those out there above the 14 I mentioned. But there was an interest in one, Senate Bill 2007, which basically requires a property manager of a cooperative or co-op a planned, unit, a planned community association or condo to be certified in property management by a national recognized body. Any yeah, thoughts? that's very interesting. Yeah, what, what, what was the reason for that? And I, I note that according to the uh, notes on this bill, Carl Rhodes, Senator Carl Rhodes, introduced it by request. So that means somebody asked him to introduce this bill, and uh, he, he did so. I saw, you know, it, it's it's hard to uh, do you know have any reason why why the bill is being you know in the submitted? past we've had uh, introductions that make all uh, property managers be a real estate broker, which makes no sense because we don't buy or sell real estate, and the education is different for a uh, community association manager. We call it. And then you deal with the issues. There's lots of associations that don't retain a managing agent and have community association managers. Then you look at the fact in condo world, you have commercial condos, spatial condos, parking condos, assisted living condos, senior living condos. There's different training and skill sets required for uh, that type of uh, association. I don't know what the issue is here because uh, you have projects that are self-managed, but. Uh, industry managers now are certainly going through training through various trade organizations. They don't call them certified in property management. That certainly is the wrong terminology. But we'll have to see what this unshakes because, again, it seems to me where people are misunderstanding that a community association manager, quote, property manager, is making the decisions. The board is making the decisions. And not only that, the manager can't practice law. So I'm not sure what's driving this, but it's certainly not appropriately worded, in my opinion, to address any relative issue in this. So we'll see what well, happens. Well, you know, you know what? You know, along that vein, I mean, there's something on your list that, uh, that we might want to talk about, and I know that it's being drafted, uh, and that's a resolution, which is, uh, which is one of the last items on your list. And, and, and that's a resolution uh, that calls for a task force to be set up to uh, come back with recommendations to the next legislature in 2021 with, a, uh, with legislation that would mandate that all condominium board members be educated and certified. And the reason for that is so that the board uh, and, and that you know goes along with a lot of these bills that want the property managers to be certified and 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 licensed and whatnot because the 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 a lot of unit owners believe that somebody needs to be responsible and if there is a law that says that board members have fiduciary duties and shouldn't you know get involved in conflicts of interest shouldn't um, uh, do selective enforcement. And you know, when you talk to some board members, they don't even know what you're talking about. And so, uh, and, and the legislators have been asking for this for a long time to, to cert, you know, mandate education of board members and certify them. So if they serve on a board, I mean, uh, they have to be uh, certified. And um, one, of the t one of the things that the task force, you know, that are gonna consider is use of the condominium ed fund and you know to you know require the uh, real estate commission to use the procurement system and hire a vendor, uh, you know to come up with a program to do webinars 
and certify board members. And, you know, uh, and the task force is going to be made up of stakeholders, plus the DCCA and the Real Estate Commission and stakeholders would be Hawaii Council, CAI, COCO, uh, you know, the, the uh, property management companies that are in town, uh, maybe, uh, you know, some uh, people from ARM and, you know, but, you know, people who are in the industry and, you know, they should be part of this task force to, uh, to give uh, uh, their input on, uh, on, on, you know, uh, what this legislation is going to look like. And the way, you know, I, uh, you know, one of the suggestions that I, I'm going to make uh, is that the DCCA actually come up with a curriculum and, and all the stakeholders should be involved in that as well. Come up with a curriculum that the, the vendors are going to be, you know, uh, uh, using in their webinars and you know, people and all the property management companies, right? They do training, and if they if they sort of if, if they can apply to the DCCA and say, okay, give us a curriculum, we're going to do the training. We'll you know take your points, and then that way, CAI, Hawaii Council, all the property management companies who already do training, right? We follow the DCCA Real Estate Commission's uh, curriculum, and we can certify. So we have all these people certifying and educating board members. And what, what, what hopefully will happen is that board members can no longer say they don't know what a fiduci what, what fiduciary duty is. They don't know, they, they understand conflict of interest and, and the obligations uh, of a board member so that to min at least maybe minimize some of the concerns made by the unit owners to the legislature. And, and you know, and, and there was this, case recently in Maui that I think, you know, uh, we, 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 you know, we had, um, what's his name? The attorney on, on Condo Insider, you know, the, the Maui one. Terry Revere. For the, uh, uh, Greg, Eric Ferrer. Er, Eric Ferrer, right? Yeah. And, 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 and in that case, the board members are named individually, but the judge, because he said, oh, these people are unpaid volunteers and I'm not going to hold them liable. The insurance company ended up paying for it, and then the, the, that, the, the cost of that settlement got spread around to all the condominiums in the state, because I know my insurance went up, my association insurance went up, my umbrella insurance went up. And I talked to Sue Savio, she says, that's what happened. So that Maui case happened, and, and you know, the insurance company had to pay. Guess who had, had to you know, chip in and, and pay off the insurance companies? And you know, so hopefully you know, this will minimize these types of events and, and, and the, with, you know, board members, you know, who are educated and, and, you know, and maybe, you know, they're, they're not going to be, you know, uh, experts, but at least they're going to know. And, and there's going to be a record because everybody who's certified is going to be, their name is going to you know, be submitted to the DCCA and they cannot say that they didn't know. And, and hopefully this will affect insurance premiums. It will affect the amount of claims that are made in the state of Hawaii. And, and so uh, that's on, on, on the table for, for next year. But the resolution is supposed to be introduced this year. Well, I'm all for the task force, because then they can deal with, does a two unit condominium have to do this? Then they can deal with the issue. Well, the biggest problem is, you know, CAI does seminars. You do seminars through HCCA. Condominium right. Council of Maui does seminars. We do Condo Insider every week. There's newsletters. The Real Estate Commission puts that information. The problem is either no one reads it or they don't go to the seminars. They, you know, these, this is right. a volunteer and job. So, but if you have a mandatory system where if you, everybody who serves on a board, if they don't get the certification, they can't serve. And hopefully that will weed out the people, you know, who are causing the problems because we all know, like the, the, that board in uh, Eric Ferrer's case, right? They didn't have a clue. I mean, they didn't have a clue yes. about uh, fiduciary duty. They didn't have a, a clue about reasonable accommodation. I mean, that was a travesty. And, you know, and if they had known or they had people who, who, who knew what the law was, then maybe they wouldn't have ended up in the lawsuit and you know we wouldn't have had a 2.9 million dollar judgment entered against an association. Yeah, I think my point is as follows: that education is good, but it needs to be the basic responsibilities. You don't need to train the board to be property managers. 
you know, then you're going right. to have nobody wants to go because it's going to become too difficult. And then you need to have education online so it's easy for people to do so that people will take this volunteer job. It's not, you're, you're not going to solve everything by thinking you can mandate a law and, uh, and fix it. So I'm all for the resolution and the task force. But it's not such a simple issue, and uh, I think right. The task but you know, this will way, sort it out. this way, I think what, what 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 we're saying is that they can be held accountable because now they're you know when when they get sued or when claims are made, they can't say, oh, we didn't know, like you know, uh, like that. I think the, the, the Eric Ferrer situation, you know, uh, you know, really showed what what could happen in the worst case analysis. You had a a board president who was a bully and he had eight sheep who just followed the board president because he was a board president, which was a wrong thing to do. And I think, you know, at, at, at a very minimum, if they, you know, ha had to take the webinar and participate in the training, they're going to know that this is a no-no and they shouldn't do it. And I think that's, that's the whole point of uh, mandatory education and certification is to let them know that there are certain things they're not supposed to do. And, this w and, and if they engage in doing it, you know, there are consequences. Well, it's interesting. Senate Bill 2871 basically talks about giving, in our case, the Real Estate Commission authority not to collect money, these biannual registration fees, if the commission determines they think there's already enough money in it. If you look at our fund today, I don't know the exact number, but I'm going to say there's about $2 million in our real estate education fund that could be used for education. And it, I would give the Real Estate Commission credit that they do some education and help sub, um, subsidize some seminars, but uh, the amount of money we're charging, we're collecting money much faster than we're spending it. We ought to look at this resolution to see what we can do to improve education. I'm all in favor right, of that. Right, and that's, you know, that's, that's why you know, uh, we're gonna be you know, meeting with the um, executive director of the Real Estate Commission to tell him, I mean, he's got all this money, and right now there's a moratorium. I mean, they have too much money, and uh, Representative Takashi Ono's committee, I think, had hearings last year, and they made a decision that there's a moratorium on uh, payments to be made to the condominium education fund because they had too much money and they're not spending it. I'm going to wrap this up now because we're end of the show. We're going to have lots more conversation in the coming weeks on bills that survive and don't survive. As always, I love working with you on this show. I love the educational opportunities for our association boards and management company and others out there. So I want to thank you for working with me today on this. I look forward to looking at the final list of bills, having a couple of glasses of wine, and then maybe having a couple more glasses of wine. But anyway, <laughs> thank you for being on the show, and, and we'll see you all on Condo Insider. Uh, tune in next Thursday, 3 o'clock. Aloha.